This video is, we're gonna, I'm going to focus on one of the passages for this week, which is Matthew 6. But before I get to that, I'm going to read a passage from another of my favorite books. One of my favorite passages from J.R.R. Tolkien's books comes right at the beginning of the story that would eventually develop into The Lord of the Rings. The first book is called The Hobbit. Right at the start, we are introduced to two characters, Bilbo Baggins, who is a hobbit, a small, quiet creature with hairy feet, who is about to embark on a life-changing adventure, and Gandalf the Grey, the wizard who is going to try to convince Bilbo to do so. And so it says right there at the start, By some curious chance, one morning long ago, in the quiet of the world, when there was less noise and more green, the hobbits were still numerous and prosperous, and Bilbo Baggins was standing at his door after breakfast, smoking an enormous long wooden pipe that reached nearly down to his woolly toes, neatly brushed. Gandalf came by. Gandalf, if you had heard only a quarter of what I have heard about him, and I have heard very little of all there is to hear, you would be prepared for any sort of remarkable tale. Tales and adventures sprouted up all over the place, wherever he went in the most extraordinary fashion. He had not been down that way under the hill for ages and ages, not since his friend the old Took died, in fact, and the hobbits had almost forgotten what he looked like. What the unsuspecting Bilbo saw that morning was an old man with a staff. He had a tall pointed blue hat, a long gray cloak, a silver scarf over which his long white beard hung down below his waist, and immense black boots. Good morning, said Bilbo, and he meant it. The sun was shining, the grass was very green, but Gandalf looked at him from under long, bushy eyebrows that stuck out further than the brim of his shady hat. What do you mean? he said. Do you wish me a good morning? Or mean that it is a good morning, whether I want it or not? Or that you feel good this morning? Or that it is a morning to be good on? All of them at once, said Bilbo, and a very fine morning for a pipe of tobacco out of doors into the, into the bargain. If you have a pipe about you, sit down and have a fill of mine. There's no hurry. We have all the day before us. Then Bilbo sat down on a seat by his door, crossed his legs, and blew out a beautiful gray ring of smoke that sailed up into the air without breaking and floated away over the hill. Very pretty, said Gandalf, but I have no time to blow smoke rings this morning. I'm looking for someone to share in an adventure that I'm arranging, and it's very difficult to find anyone. I should think so in these parts. We are plain, quiet folk and have no use for adventures. Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things make you late for dinner. I can't think what anyone sees in them, said our Mr. Baggins, and stuck one thumb behind his braces and blew out another even bigger smoke ring. Then he took out his morning letters and began to read, pretending to take no more notice of the old man. He had decided that he was not quite his sort and wanted him to go away. But the old man did not move. He stood leaning on his stick and gazing at the hobbit without saying anything, till Bilbo got quite uncomfortable and even a little cross. Good morning, he said at last. We don't want any adventures here, thank you. You might try over the hill and cross the water. By this he meant that the conversation was at an end. What a lot of things you do use good morning for, said Gandalf. Now you mean that you want to get rid of me and that it won't be good until I move off. I love that passage. Good morning is a phrase that can be used for many different purposes, with many different meanings. There are many words and phrases that don't have a particular meaning until you use them in a particular way. We have learned that lesson over and over as we've tried to translate our words back and forth over here. Another phrase like that is the phrase, don't worry about it. This is a phrase that can have several different meanings. As a birthday or as Christmas approaches, and my mother-in-law sees one of us about to buy something that she intends to buy for us as a gift, she has a habit of using that phrase. Don't worry about it, she says with a wink, without coming out and telling us what she's up to. What she means is, don't concern yourself with it. I'll be getting it for you. 
you'll have it in no time. A phrase much like this shows up in the sixth chapter of Matthew, right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, starting in verse 25, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? You have little faith. Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? For it's the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Don't worry about it. Jesus tells his hearers. The question we need to ask is, what does he mean when he says it? Does he mean it in the way that my mother-in-law means it when Christmas is around the corner and she's trying to tell us that we'll get what, we, what whatever we want? Just let God know what you want. Sort of like the way we used to dog-ear the pages of the Sears and Penny's Christmas catalogs. This analogy will make no sense to anyone in the room younger than me. The point is, all the things you want will be delivered to your doorstep. Don't be anxious about whether you'll get all the clothes and food and stuff that you want. Just sit back, relax. God's got you covered. It can certainly sound that way. That's the way I've heard it and read it myself. However, we failed to read the rest of the passage just now. In particular, the verses leading up to this one. We fail to ask, as John Willis would put it, what the therefore is there for. It's always there for something. The passage we heard a moment ago begins with, therefore. He says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or wear. So what is the therefore therefore? How is this passage connected to the one that leads up to it? Let's read the verses leading up to this one. The whole chapter is relevant, but since this sermon's already getting a bit long-winded, we'll just start with verse 19. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Therefore, do not worry. Ironically, we've used this very passage where Jesus is drawing us away from the love of things, we've used this very passage as a way of propping up our devotion to wealth and stuff. Don't worry about it. God's got you covered. Sit back. God will deliver all the things your heart desires to your doorstep. But that's the reverse of what the passage is about. He's not saying all your heart's desires will be met and fulfilled. He's saying you need to change your heart's desires. You need to stop devoting yourself to status and wealth and power, your own ego. You need a new heart that, as C.S. Lewis would put it, is not filled with the clamor of self-will. This brings us to a, another way that this sort of text can be warped and used to evil and sinful ends. That is, when we take texts like this and use them against others. In other words, we make the text say something like, you should not worry so much about, or complain so much about, or raise your voice so much about the ways 
that I am robbing you of clothes and food and shelter and safety and wellness. You should not worry so much about the ways that I am harming or just ignoring you. You ever notice how much more immediate and vital and fatal our own wounds and hardships are? And how quick we are to dismiss others when they raise their voices? Especially groups of people whom we as a culture are in the habit of ignoring? This is a pattern. We want our own pain to be acknowledged and resolved, but we tend to ignore the pleas and cries and complaints of others, especially those whose cries might cost us something or make us rethink something about ourselves. Scripture is not a weapon to use against others, though. Jesus' message is for all of us. He's saying, devote yourself, not to yourself, not to all these other empty things. Devote yourself, devote your heart to things that really matter. Don't let your heart be drawn in by things that are ultimately without any significance or meaning. And don't let it just be turned in towards itself. Moreover, beyond all this, this is not just another sermon that Jesus is delivering here. With this sermon, with the Sermon on the Mount, what he's ultimately doing is announcing, introducing, manifesting a whole other kingdom where the normal rules of class, the normal ways of valuing things and self over God and neighbor is overturned. He's providing a contrast between what he calls the kingdom of heaven and the ways, the way things are around his hearers in that moment. And so he points to the hypocrites who give money and pray prayers and worship out of ego and self-interest. He points to those whose first love is things that tend not to give life but to suck it away. Things that tend to be the objects of competition and rivalry. Things that encourage their owners to hoard and fear, and be more and more concerned with their own security and prosperity and power, and less and less concerned with the well-being of the people around them. To all this, he provides, he personifies a contrast. In his speech, in his very person, he's challenging the current state of things and saying there's a better way. What you're devoting your lives to are shadows, he's saying. Beyond the shadows is a real world of substance and light and life and love, where we find ourselves, our whole selves, not by trying to get more and more stuff, but by giving ourselves away, loving our neighbors with the kind of love we extend to ourselves. This is a better way. Therefore, do not worry about these other things. I pray God's blessings on all of you. We love you all, we miss you, and we hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.